the video games industry is a little bit different in that we are very specialized when it comes to the different kinds of programmer roles. There's been a few companies that have tried to shake that up a little bit. I, I know for a point in time, Amazon Game Studios was hiring everybody as just an engineer, but I, I don't think that worked out very well for them. And I think for the most part, um, unlike other industries, it is going to be very specialized. And that's, that's kind of a, a misunderstanding because uh, people aren't really aware, I think, of all the different programming roles that even fall into being a, a video game engineer. Someone might say, oh, you know, I'm a game coder, but what does that really mean? There's so many different roles. Today, I wanted to unpack that and look at a bunch of different roles. So I thought maybe we jump into uh, Rockstar Games' career page. So there's nothing special about Rockstar Games. Well, I mean, they're a big studio. They're, I mean, they're probably one of the largest decentralized video game makers out there. So yeah, you know, there's a lot of special things about Rockstar, to be honest. But I guess what I wanted to call attention to was just, there's so many just jobs in general. And I specifically noticed that all of the coding seems to be in the code section. Though there are programming roles that aren't in the code section. So I had seen one earlier. So for example, there's an analytics section and a senior data engineer is probably, I mean, we can look at what they're doing. But I imagine these guys are also doing some coding as well. So th these guys are, are dealing with Hadoop, which I understand is a, and they're also using Azure, and they're writing in SQL, which you might not say is a coding language, but Python and, and Java certainly are, and sh you know, they're shell scripting. So these guys are doing uh, a certain kind of coding, which I wouldn't really associate at all with game development, but they're analyzing the data and all the trends that are happening with the games that are being played. So I, I guess that's sort of beyond the scope of this video. There's a whole team of people who are just, you know, doing supporting analytics. And uh, I think there's also a testing department here. It's not sticking out to me right now, but there's also a whole host of people who just are doing testing on the game as well. And so there's coders there as well, you know, programmers there as well. But uh, just for the sake of this video, I thought we'd zoom in a little bit and just look at the code sections. So these are people who are working on the game itself besides, you know, all those other roles where they're maybe analyzing the feedback or um, statistics, playtime, stuff like that, engagement of people who are sort of interacting with the game. These are these instead are the people who just make the game. And boy, are there, <laughs> there's a lot of different roles here already, isn't there? Um, so the first thing, when you look at these roles, this may be obvious to some folks, but there's some modifiers on the role that actually doesn't change the kind of work you're doing so much. So for example, an associate engine programmer, associate just means that they're like junior, okay? In uh, some companies, they don't use the term junior. Uh, they just use the term associate, but it's the same thing. It just basically means you're sort of starting out. Uh, associate is, hey, I, apparently it means different things in other industries. My girlfriend is a, uh, like a consultant and I think associate is actually like a promotion from the junior but in this case associate is actually base level so uh, little things like that if you say senior it's sort of just the opposite a senior is sort of higher than a mid-level so mid-level usually doesn't even get a delimiter like uh, maybe that's not the right word but like mid-level they just say programmer they don't say anything they don't say mid programmer and so under it, they specify associate, then mid, they don't say anything. And then senior, they'll say like senior. So that, that's just a little sort of something to keep your head out for. I'm listening to some video game music here. <laughs> Apparently it's copyright free. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but I'll just have that on the background. Okay, so that's the first thing to knock out. Then beyond that, Let's see what we have here. I guess there's some main groups that we could already see. There's UI, gameplay, engine, graphics, physics, animation, and ML, which is not a category that I have seen. So I think that's kind of interesting. So there's a bunch of people who are doing ML and that's pretty much it. I've also noticed that some roles are specifically called out for what kind of physics they're doing. So it looks like this role is specifically vehicle physics. So I guess that's all you do all day. You're just working on vehicle physics. And that, that seems to be common. And of course, Rockstar is known for their Grand Theft Auto franchise, and they have lots of vehicles in those games. So I think that makes sense. 
why you might have somebody kind of specialize to make those look really good and feel really great. I'm curious if there's anything specific they're looking for for the vehicle physics programmer versus any other programmer. I guess you need to be really passionate about vehicles. I remember in, uh, um, what was it? And uh, when I was working on Call of Duty, there was a programmer I worked with who did pretty much all of the physics, the vehicle physics for us. Um, and he, he was brilliant, you know, because uh, he, he, you know, was working on kind of mapping out the engines and stuff. And I think one of the frustrating things about being a game programmer, especially one who's maybe very knowledgeable about the physics systems, is you have to know when to sort of simplify it in a sense, because you need to... Um, you need to find a balance between what's realistic and also what's fun to play, you know. And I, I think that that was always something that, uh, you know, I got frustrated on with with our game because I found that the the vehicle physics for the in in Call of Duty were just like they didn't feel good, even if they were like totally accurate. So I think that's a really hard balance to find. Um, you know, not to say that you're faking it necessarily, but sometimes you need to simplify it so that the user doesn't have to worry about so many things, so they could worry about. You know, just the most important thing, which might be which direction to go and who to shoot. You know, you might want, you might not want them to worry about, you know, uh, you know, using a stick shift and and, and changing. A... Gosh, I don't know anything about cars. So <laughs> I don't really know what stick shifts do, but I guess like changing the throttle. Is that what it's called? Um, manual, you know, all that stuff. Like, I, I feel like it's, it's a it's a difficult question. And I, I think that's kind of where uh, game design might lead into it a little bit. Okay, I see. So for them, they're saying basically uh, there's cutoff. So you're not going to be a senior unless you've done two years of experience, which is like hilarious, isn't it? That in, in our industry, it's so young that someone's a senior if they have two years of experience, right? That's like, uh, that just seems like nothing, right? Compared to other industries where you might study your craft for quite realistically a decade before you're considered, uh, you know, a, a, a true artisan of the work. It's like, wow, in, in this industry, you're a senior after, after two years. Right, um, less than basically an undergraduate degree, less than maybe half of that, uh, and boom, you're a senior. It's just a, it's just an interesting nomenclature. Uh, this ind this industry is known for chewing people up, right? So I, people don't last as long in this industry as other ones. So that's certainly a, that's certainly a part of it. And I, I think turnover in Rockstar is a, uh, it's pretty high relative to other, uh, other game companies. But it's uh, it's just it's just something to, it's just an interesting note. So when we look at this one, the ML operations, I'm I'm fascinated by what this role is. I have no idea what this even means. So let's let me jump into another song here. I'm just gonna keep jumping between these two because they're like less annoying. Um, so what is what does an ML operations engineer do? This is one, for example, that I'm not even familiar with. So this guy is standing up ML ops systems to support R and D developers. What does that mean? Support ML ops technologies. Not sure what that is either. Okay. Docker, Kubernetes, Airflow. Okay. So I'm not familiar with what any of these technology stacks are, which I guess goes to show you just how broad this stuff is. Um, you know, it's a, it's an awesome Big Ten industry, but um, I'm not sure. So it looks like they're doing Python programming, but what what's like their goal? What are they doing? They're developing animation technology through performance capture. Okay, character animation. Oh, okay. I think I understand what they're doing. Um, though that that was a weird way to describe it. I think I think what this role is is basically. So what happens is sometimes when you're uh, doing motion capture animation, you will have a lot of data that comes in, right? So for example, you put somebody in one of those black suits with the little uh, tracking balls on it, and they move around, and that gives you a really good sort of raw idea of what this person is doing. You know how they animate their movements and stuff. But sometimes it's kind of noisy. And you need to interpret that data into a much more um, simplified format for use in the video game. Because that's probably like way too much data and way too much noise in order for you to directly port into a game. And so I think what they're using is machine learning 
which is basically sort of a, a system that can dynamically make decisions like uh, artificial intelligence in order to interpret that raw data and convert it into a format that they can use for gameplay animation and technical art purposes. So I, I think that's what this role is doing, though they didn't do a very good job of explaining it. But I, I think that's basically the idea here. And so apparently the tech stack that they do that is a Python-based interfacing with, I guess these are third-party systems called Docker, Kubernetes, and Airflow. Okay, very interesting. Not something I'm familiar with at all, but it seems like this is like emerging because apparently it's, it's R&D, which means research and development. So this is something that maybe is a new tool that they're trying to support. Uh, but that, that sounds like it could be a really cool experience for somebody who's passionate about that kind of stuff. Interesting. And then this one is a senior data engineer. Okay, so we were looking at this earlier. So this is just pure analytics. And so this might be somebody who, uh, let's see. So what might they be doing? So this is interesting. So for this one, you need a minimum of five years of experience using machine learning, two years of experience using specifically Hadoop systems, which as I understand it, Hadoop is, uh, I think it's a database uh, system. I think it's a way that you store data. So that must be how they've stored the data. And so you need to have some experience with interfacing with that system. And then another two years of experience using the Azure ecosystem. So Azure is a Microsoft product that I think does a number of things, but one of them, I guess, is they have a, a machine learning library that you could use. So perhaps the idea here is that you have some experience with data modeling and you need to be able to understand how to use Azure systems to interpret data stored on Hadoop. I think that's the general idea here. So again, not something I'm familiar with at all, but it's, uh, it's very cool. jumping around in my music a little bit. Okay, let's let's uh, let's look at some of the ones that I might be a bit more familiar with. Some of the stuff that's actually working on the game. So, the first one here is just the engine programmer. So, engine programming is uh it's it's usually the well, engine so basically the engine programming and graphics programming, I would say as well, are sort of the lowest level when it comes to game programming. And what low level means is, you know, sometimes they, people think that's derogatory, uh, you know, who are not familiar with programming, let's say they think it means, oh, that's easy. But actually, it's almost like the opposite. Uh, the engine programmers are using sort of the most fundamental uh, coding languages, and that's actually very hard. <laughs> They're building the stuff that everything else goes on top of. It's sort of like laying the foundation for all the other work that happens. And so, yeah, so they're calling that out here, low-level C++ development. You know, that's thinking about sort of the core systems of memory management and and signal processing and, and, and using uh, system performance. What else are they calling out here? All that kind of stuff. Very cool role, especially these days. You know, I, I think uh, we're in a bit of a really bad time right now in uh, engine development because we're seeing the... Uh, we're seeing the industry sort of collapse a bit on itself, where once upon a time, every video game that was ever made was pretty much on its own engine. Now the engines are slowly collating into just a few in the industry, um, mainly Unity and Unreal. And so these two companies are basically, uh, you know, sucking up all the different engine programmers. We saw recently CD Projekt Red decide to sort of sunset their own engine and, and move to UE4. So it's uh, it's it, it, it's kind of sad to see, but I, I think what that foretells for the future is that there's gonna be just a greater and greater demand for people who know how to do engine programming, because I think they're gonna be harder and harder to come by, especially as these roles basically get deleted as people decide to use more and more third-party engines. Um, it's hard work, you know? This is interesting, some of the pluses here. You need to be able to... Uh, they're calling out specifically x86 disassembly. I wonder if they're asking you to maybe be able to read the, the disassembly code and sort of interpret what's going on there. I think that might be what they're saying. Um, 
understanding algorithmic complexity. That that might be a little bit silly if somebody didn't know any of that and was applying to this job. Um, SIMD. So as I understand it, uh, SIMD means uh, I think single instruction, multiple something, right? Something like that. Multiple data. The basic idea here is that you um, computers can do this interesting thing where if you give them five math problems that are kind of similar, it can solve all of them at once as long as you give them together in a group. And so the idea with SIMD is that you try to take advantage of that uh, cool stuff. It's not something I've, I've worked with too much before. So that, that's basically the idea behind the engine team is you're, you're, I mean, as it's saying, you know, you're sort of squeezing the most out of the underlying hardware. So you need to have a really strong understanding of how each of the different platforms you're working on, it, it can be best used to sort of, you know, leverage the hard work that the graphics team and art teams and maybe to a lesser degree, the gameplay teams are working on. Cool. So that's sort of somebody who might be passionate about engine programming is somebody who's really passionate about um, really complex systems and understanding how they work. Sort of somebody who might, the, the same kind of person who might want to take apart a robot and kind of understand the inner workings of how it all fits together, how all the little pieces, you know, turn. Uh, someone like a watchmaker, you know, people who are sort of fascinated by the mechanics of things. I think that's the kind of person who would be really into uh, engine programming. And then very similarly, when it comes to physics programming, I guess, I wonder, do they have just general physics? Okay, they do. Yeah, so here's a physics programmer. I guess somebody who's a little bit more interested in um, physics programming, I'd say it's mostly the same kind of person who would be interested in that. But the problems that they're dealing with are, are a little bit different. I mean, obviously, they're physics in nature versus uh, just more generic engine in, in flavor. So a physics programmer is always going to be working on physics problems where a graphics, I mean, a, an engine programmer might be dealing with graphics programmers, physics programs. It, it's a little bit more generalized. UI developer. What is that? So this is somebody who does UI and UX. Okay, interesting. So this is somebody who works in a higher level language than C++. They're working in maybe C Sharp or some sort of scripting language. Experience with scale form. I'm not familiar with that. What is that? Okay. It's some sort of some sort of graphic game engine. Okay, interesting. That must be what Rockstar uses by default. Hmm. So, so what exactly is this person doing? Hmm. So it, it, it sounds like this is a bit of a generalist role where they're sort of taking the concepts of the UI interface and making them interactable. So as everybody knows, it's a lot easier to sort of um, draw the UI interface than to kind of get all the buttons together. That part usually takes a lot longer. So typically, um, you know, uh, not, not maybe we shouldn't say it's easier, right? Because I think good UI design is also, you know, it's a tough skill in itself. But I think the idea here is that maybe the UI artists or designers sort of create the spec and then this person would try to implement that. So somebody who'd be interested in this is somebody who's really interested in, I mean, user interface design. Somebody who wants to uh, sort of have the work with designers to understand how best to sort of interact with complex systems. I mean, uh, this is just a skill set in itself, right? It's like you can have something that's really hard, that's really complicated, and a good UX designer is going to find a way to sort of make that complicated thing easy to interact with. Maybe through simplifying it through some means or just sort of having a different control sort of emergently displayed to the user so they don't have to deal with the full complexity of a system in every case. Hmm. What else do we have here? So UI programmer. Hmm. So I have no idea what the difference between a UI programmer and a UI developer would be. Okay. So I, and I call attention to that because truthfully, I think these, the names of these roles can sometimes vary a lot from studio to studio. And uh, if you're a little bit, if you're like, ah, UI developer versus UI programmer, that sounds very similar. What's the difference? Um, I'm here to tell you that 
it's okay. And I also have no idea why they've decided to split those roles with those distinctions, right? For them, it probably makes a lot of sense. But for somebody who's looking in, who, who's not familiar with what those titles mean, it, I, they haven't done a great job to explain it. So, I mean, we, we could see the obvious difference here is that the programmer is doing C, C++, while the developer is doing C Sharp, right? So it sounds like the developer is kind of using scripting and sort of probably doing a lot more implementation of kind of designs that have been prescribed for them. And it sounds like the programmer is probably creating the functionality that that the developers can kind of hook into. And this is a very common relationship in the video game industry, where basically you'll have some people who are doing the sort of underlying te tech work, similar to like the engine programmer we were talking about before. And then you'll have scripters who support the programmers, or I should say it's the other way around. It's like the programmers support the scripters and the scripters kind of interface with the programmers work through a much more lightweight uh, language that can be iterated on a lot faster and is probably a little bit more accessible. So you can have more people hired for that role because it's a bit less specialized. It's obviously a lot harder to hire a programmer than a scripter, but, um, but that seems to be the distinction here bet between the two. So I guess, I guess uh, the difference between whether or not you'd want to be uh, a developer versus the programmer is probably, um, probably how comfortable you are with sort of these C, C++ programming languages. If, if this is kind of where you like to work, then that might be a good fit for you. If you like sort of the more high level uh, scripting, then C Sharp is probably a better fit. Somebody who's coming from, you know, Unity, for example, probably wouldn't have C, C++ experience. So, uh, you know, if you're maybe a hobbyist game developer, maybe the, the developer role is the place to start. And then you can uh, dip your toe into some of the programming if that's, you know, the career path you want to take. I, I, I think it's typical, though, that... Um, Usually, yeah. No, that's, that's all I'll say about that. Um, so let's see. So that's I think that's it for the uh, Rockstar Dundee. What are some other roles that we haven't looked at so far? So this is AI programmer. So I'm doing AI programming right now, which is very similar, I feel, to gameplay programming. In fact, look at this. In this case, they have a, a role which is called AI slash gameplay. So it seems like they they've just combined them at this company though oh what is this so rockstar north has an ai programmer but they also got ai gameplay systems programmer so systems programming is is something we could talk about uh, as well that it, it, it's an interesting uh, little addition there that they've added here and here I'm, I'm curious what they meant by that maybe we'll understand if we read the doc a bit more um but yeah i mean ai and gameplay are very similar on many in many uh in many studios, it's kind of the same thing. I can't recall exactly, but I think when I worked on the God of War team, I think gameplay did all the AI. I don't know if there was a special group of coders just for AI. I can't remember. But typically, AI is part of gameplay. Unless the game you're working on is so large, it justifies having its own team of just dedicated AI people. And um, the studio I'm working at right now, it's software. I just transitioned from being a gameplay programmer to an AI programmer, and uh, I've kind of been experiencing what what that difference is like. It, it kind of depends a bit more on every uh, every studio is a little bit different, but AI is basically just. I mean, gameplay is a bit more generalized. You know, AI is a bit of a specialist, and AI programmers are typically working at a higher level than gameplay programmers. You know, you're interfacing with things like not that much, but a little bit. So you're interfacing probably with things like behavior trees and um, and other sort of uh, runtime data structures that are used for AI systems that gameplay teams, uh, you know, might not touch. Uh, I wouldn't say it, it's necessarily more or less complicated. There isn't that relationship like there was maybe with the uh, the developer and programmer for the UI. So what's going on here? So it sounds like, um, it 
looks like the roles for AI programmer are, are pretty fairly entry level. So it seems like someone with one year of game experience and then you can jump into that. I wonder how that maps to the gameplay programmer. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it's, it is very different, right? So for this role, they want a minimum of three years. I'm curious why. I guess the gameplay systems takes three years to figure out, huh? When they say gameplay systems, well, usually what they mean is that it's not, uh, it's not the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Usually gameplay systems means it's like the broader gameplay project. So, for example, a gameplay system might not be combat with an artificial intelligence. Like, uh, for example, in Grand Theft Auto, if you commit crimes, the police come and fight you, right? So gameplay programming might be designing the guns uh, that shoot between the player and the policeman and how much damage they take if they got hit. Whereas gameplay systems would be more like designing the... the the wanted system that determines whether or not the policeman is going to come after you and determining how many policemen should come after you and determining how much crime you need to commit before the, you know, before the uh, police decide to come after you. So I think that's probably what AI gameplay systems means. It's like, those are the gameplay systems, that sort of systems level uh, design problem that is specifically related to AI, which I guess the... The cops would be a pretty good example of that in uh, in Rockstar. So that's that's kind of interesting. So I, I guess I guess they feel that that additional sort of you know that higher picture view requires a little bit more experience in order to uh, to get that. So here I see there's a tools programmer. I wonder if there's just a tools programmer role. No, there isn't. Okay, that's a little bit weird to be honest. Um, most studios will have a tools team, so it looks like they only have a tools role for graphics. I wonder if that's because maybe the UI team, like UI programmers, make the make the UI tools, and the gameplay programmers make the gameplay tools? I'm not too sure. I'm also not too sure what the difference is between a graphics programmer and a graphics tools programmer in that case. Maybe we could jump, we could open up those two and kind of try to figure out the difference there. So these guys make tools that are used by everybody. And they use tools that integrate with 3DX Max and Houdini, which are content authoring tools. So it sounds like an artist might make a some sort of content in Houdini and then you'd need to create something like a pipeline in order to import those things into the game. So this is very similar to the uh, the ML operations person we were talking about before, where they're sort of taking um, motion capture data and converting it into a format that they can use in the game. Similarly, it sounds like the graphics tools programmer is, again, a role that's explicitly in sort of an intermediary role in the pipeline, who's sort of taking content that's created by an artist and converting it into the game not the motion capture but in this case it's the stuff that's made in houdini or some of these other content authoring programs like 3dx max which is i believe akin to maya or blender if you're more familiar with those terms okay interesting so th this is an interesting role because you're sort of doing a bit of scripting and pipeline work so you need to know C, you need to know C++, you need to know C Sharp. It's a lot of, um, a lot of different languages that might come into play here. This is a very, this is a probably a very difficult role to hire for. Because it sounds like you also need to have some understanding of the shaders as well. So it's a, it's a very interesting role. You're sort of in the middle of, of a lot of stuff. This could be a great role for somebody who sort of, um, loves art and is a programmer and so they want to understand sort of how everything comes together into the game um this is, is, is a very cool role so the graphics programmer is yeah that's something totally different so while this guy is sort of focused on getting the content authored into the game graphics programmer is totally different this is somebody who's just 
developing the visuals for the game. So they're probably, um, they're probably not directly interfacing with, like, 3DS Max or some of these other content authoring tools. They're just working solely within the engine and building the engine to give high fidelity graphics and with a, with as basically as a, as good a performance as they as they can achieve so i think that's what this role is doing so as you can see like these terms are all a little bit new to me because every every company does it they explain it a little bit differently and you kind of got to dive in there and kind of say like okay graphics tools programmer what does that mean and go in there and and, and try to understand it right because when i think graphics tools i think about runtime uh, debugging tools. I don't think about the pipeline. So it's just, it's just its own nomenclature, really. Is there any other ones we want to look into? I think we've hit almost all of them. What's this one? Associate Production Coordinator Code. I have no idea what that is. A production assistant who's highly organized and passionate about supporting the code production team. Okay. So this is maybe a mistake then to include this in the coding section because this is not a coder who you're looking for. This is looking for somebody who's basically a producer who can manage the schedule for the coders. So uh, I don't know, maybe this is a typo or something for them to include that. I don't know why they did that. I guess you're on the code team, but you're, you know, you're a producer, right? It's not a coder. So I don't know. Everybody, everybody does it a little differently, but I, I, I highly doubt that a producer is going to be... This is probably just a typo or something. Um, Alright, and I think that's it. I'm wondering if any... Oh, network programmer. So this is interesting. I mean, it's no secret that uh, Rockstar's kind of biggest game right now is their online mode. It's been an amazing success for them. Really strong. And um, you need people who are just going to focus on that exact problem. That is a, another example of kind of a bit of a specialized skill set. Understanding how to do network programming is, is a little bit difficult. It's not something that everybody usually gets familiarized with. So it sounds like these guys, they basically don't have a bar to jump over. They want you to have a degree or equivalent, right? Which means, you know, it doesn't mean anything. So these guys, so, you know, they, they definitely need network programmers. That sounds like a really, uh, a job that's, I guess, quite in demand. And basically, uh, they just need you to know how to code. Just need to know how to program C, C++. I'm curious what the, uh, what the coding test might be for someone like this in order to, uh, to test whether or not perhaps they have success in that environment. Hmm. animation systems so an animation systems is okay so this is to join the animation R&D team and what are these folks doing okay so they are doing performance capture to a runtime engine is this the same thing as the ML role we were just looking at Maybe. I wonder what they mean by new animation features. I wonder what that means. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, th this role is very, uh, very sparse in sort of describing it. So it's just you're working on the animation technology system pipeline and tools all right yeah it, it's it's not really clear what this is doing I, I guess it's a bit more of a generalized role sort of just working within animation support and and of course none of this includes a technical animator i don't think it does and the technical animator is sort of its own role perhaps that would have been under animation so if we look in under animation i see there's a technical face animator so I guess that's a that's a bit of a specific kind of technical animator, but basically a technical animator is somebody who is sort of doing the rigging for the models and uh, and stuff like that. They're, they're 
Are they programming? Maybe they're building tools for the animation team, you know? Within uh, maybe like a, a Blender add-on or something like that, or Maya, whatever it is. But uh, they're typically not programming in the engine. These people really don't work in the engine at all. They're just working on content authoring. And then once the content is created and kind of handed off, they're done. You know, with, with, the, uh, with that asset as far as they're concerned. So this is another sort of sort of a scripting role, which is, I, I'd say, certainly adjacent to coding, but it's not in the code section. Hmm, so how would I tell somebody whether or not they're interested in scripting or coding, whether or not they should go into animation versus the code section? I'm not sure. I guess it depends on how interested you are in the art and, uh, and bringing to life some of the graphics. That may be uh, what I would think about. Just to determine whether or not animation is uh, the right, I guess, team for you to be in with this role. But again, I mean, it, it varies so much, right? So we, we've been talking about, uh, how long has this been? This has been half an hour. So we've been just looking at the Rockstar roles. I'm sure that if we looked at a different company, like, uh, go to Bungie. See what's going on at Bungie. All right, so they've got a engineering team. And we're seeing a lot of uh, the roles we saw before. Of course, we have a lot more in test roles. I don't know why Rockstar does not have test engineers. That was a little bit weird. Maybe they, maybe each team has to write their own tests. I'm not sure. mobile engineer that's interesting i did not know bungie was working on mobile games i guess maybe that's something in their future that we could look forward to that's kind of interesting so yeah it looks like people who are doing ios and android development it sounds like it's going to be native development too they're not using an engine like uh like unity it's kind of interesting. Yeah, lots of different roles. All right, so hopefully that gives you uh, a decent idea about um, all the many, 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 many different roles that uh, somebody can have as a programmer, as a coder within the games industry. I mean, there's tons, right? We, we spent half an hour looking at over a dozen at least, and uh, and there's many more we didn't talk about. like roles that are sort of within the animation department that are doing coding uh, like that uh, technical animator and stuff like that uh, that wouldn't even normally get associated with this role and then of course there was many we skipped just from the beginning like the people who are doing the data analytics in, uh, in departments that are outside of the actual game development team so there's a lot there's a lot that somebody can do and I think it can be a little bit scary <laughs> maybe uh, as somebody who's just coming into the industry for the first time who who has taken maybe some basic coding courses and they're like, okay, now I want to code on a video game, but what part of this giant behemoth do I fit into? Uh, so hopefully some of those explanations helped you to think about the differences and, and which one would be the better fit for you, you know? Um, I think that's all I have to say about that. If you have any questions, let me know in the comment section below and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. But uh, I think probably it's going to vary for each company. So you've really got to read whatever the job post description is. And then from there, the interview is really a great place. If you get to the interview stage for you to ask them, you know, what does this job entail with respect to the day to day activities, whether or not this is going to be a good fit for what I'm passionate about. And uh, usually if they're giving you some sort of assessment, that's a good, that's a good way to tell what you're going to be doing in the actual job. You know, if they give you an assessment that's all 3D math, dot product and cross product, and, you know, trigonometry and that stuff, you might think, oh, I love this stuff. Then that's probably going to be a good fit for you. If you're like, oh, I like programming, but, you know, I'm not really passionate about math, then that's probably, uh, that's probably an indicator that that might not be the best role for, for your skills. All right. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Thanks.